for showing up tonight for the October meeting of the Madison Astronomical Society. Um, just to give everyone's a heads up, we have a little bit of formal business, formal club business to attend to this evening, where we want to review, discuss, and approve some proposed spending for maintenance at, for our observing site, Yana Research Station. Um, so unless there's any concerns right now, I'd like to call the formal meeting to order. And I just got a message email from Martin saying that he doesn't see this new Zoom link. Um, can, oh. Could somebody could, could somebody else on the board maybe send them if you saw Martin's oh, email? Yeah. All right, oh, thanks. Because yeah, I, I have a hard time doing two things at the same time. So all right, it's 7.13 p.m. And I'm gonna go ahead and call the meeting to order. <clears throat> All right, on the agenda, we have a motion that has been proposed by the Madison Astronomical Society Board of Directors. The motion for the purpose of discussion, the motion reads the following. For the purpose of increasing the number of electrical outlets at IANA Research Station, Madison Astronomical Society shall accept the August 30th, 2021 bid from Hill Electric to increase to 200 amp service, including options for a junction box and surge protection for an amount not to exceed $3,000. Shall we initiate discussion? Any discussion, anyone? Move to a sensible thing to do. Oh, what? I said it sounds like a sensible thing to do. Yep. And unless anyone has any questions, just to re refresh uh, the situation, um, we have uh, how many, Jurgen, how many members do we have as of the end of September? At end of September, we had 137 members. Okay, so the club is getting bigger and from time to time we have had limited access for uh, concrete pads for everyone who would like to have one at Yana Research Station and we're using more and more electricity. So this is all part of an effort that is not part of the discussion tonight, but we are look, leaning towards, we're trying to go towards increasing the number of concrete pads and the number, increasing the number of people who can use Yana Research Station at the same time. So the goal here is right now we are currently at 100 amp service in the in the junction box in the clubhouse, and we would like to double that. Yeah, um, I, should also, I should also mention, Lawrence, that this uh, to, currently we have no uh, uh, line surge protection out there for people's equipment, and this would include surge protection too. Exactly. And, and one other one other thing is that this is part of phase two, but. We have four electrical outlets for the six pads, and they're all on one on one uh, circuit breaker, so that doesn't work very efficiently. All right, and just as part of the business, I'm going to verify now um, that we do we do need to have a quorum of at least fifteen percent of the membership, for, according to an email I received from Jurgen recently. We need at least twenty one members to do that which we do have. And I'd also like to verify that we have at least three board members present at this meeting, which we do. I see myself yep. here and I saw, I saw Dan a little while ago and I'm sure I'm, and I'm, Chris is here. Yep. Just, about the whole board is here. Dan is here. So is there any further discussion? And remember, for, I'd like to remind everyone that if you're muted and you're trying to say something right now, please unmute. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I think we've got Jeffrey Shockler has seconded the motion. Who originally made the motion? Well, I, I, I read the motion, but you're gonna- I, I said, I move to approve. Okay, so- right, I've, I've got a question. Yes, Joseph, hi, Joseph. Hi. Um... I haven't been in the meetings for a while, but uh, I do re recall that you, you've got the checking account, you've got a savings account, and you should have an endowment fund. Exactly. Have you, guys, 
have you guys put together you've got a budget that yes. um and you've got your 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 projected revenues coming in for your membership is more than your expenses yes exactly and thanks for reminding everyone those are great points uh you're going to you just recently put together our, our quarterly uh summary do you want to say we, something yeah we've i've been treasurer now for for five years and over that time we have grown the club resources by somewhere over twenty thousand dollars Checking account right now is about twenty-three thousand, and our CDs add up to close to twenty thousand. We we are still got about uh, close to sixty members who have to renew. And by the way, if you haven't renewed, please do. Um, so we we estimate for this phase one, we have the money in hand, no problem. Phase two is another issue. We are going to be looking at bids, and that'll be a separate issue that will come to the um to to a membership meeting uh late either later this year or early next year but we expect to have this fully paid for we won't do anything that is not fully paid for and we will have sufficient resources afterwards so that we will um be able to conduct business afterwards i want to make sure that we have at least 15 to twenty thousand dollars in all resources after phase two is done um so we're not tight on funds yeah, and Joseph brings up an important reminder about the endowment fund. We still have an endowment fund, and I think that is what I'm pulling numbers just out of my memory. It's under seven, just between six and seven thousand dollars that are are non touchable funds. It's actually exactly six thousand. The board uh, three years ago actually put aside that money, and it's not to be used for anything else. It's actually in the um, bylaws. That's correct. Does that answer your questions, Joe? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that uh, I'm, a, I'm an accounting type. I'm a cost accountant. I'm a CPA. So it's I always want to make sure that you, if you're going to spend money, you got to make sure you got it and you're going to be set up for the future, which you are. So it's uh, you're fine by me. We wanted to make we wanted to make sure this never came up until we began to realize we had the resources to actually look at doing it and make decisions about how much we can actually do. And when Jurgen says phase two, part of the phase two is in addition to adding the concrete pads, and this is phase one, which we're not at yet. We're not at phase two yet, but in addition, phase two is in addition to adding the concrete pads is to renovate the electrical system um, and, and get that infrastructure so that it's solid for years and years to come. And to give you a bit of a preview, we're looking at that no, no earlier than the fall of next year probably closer to spring or summer of 2023. So this is a long-term project that we're doing. All right, is there any further questions or discussion? All right, it looks like we have a motion on the table. We've had a first from uh, Jurgen and a second from Jeff Schokler. All those in favor of the motion or should I reread it? Do you, does anyone need me to reread the motion? No. Okay. No. All right. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye or giving a thumbs up sign. Aye. 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 All those. I don't have video on. Aye. All right. All those against the motion signify by saying nay or giving a thumbs down. Hearing no no votes, um, it's a, the opinion of the chair that the ayes have it. Is, it really uh, is, right? there, is there any objection to that opinion? I'm hearing no objection. In the opinion of the chair, the motion is approved. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, and do I hear a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll move to adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> motion by Kevin to adjourn and second by was that was that Martin or I think Martin and Charles. Martin and Charles, okay. <laughs>
All those in favor of adjourning, signify by saying aye. 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 Thumbs up. <laughs> All those against, signify by saying nay. It is the opinion of the chair that the yeas have it. Meeting adjourned. And it I is. The treasurer wants to thank everybody for being such nice people. <laughs> and I have stopped my recording. All right. And, and by the uh, way, I just wanted to say for, for people who are curious about when this will happen, Lawrence is going to sign the contract and this will all happen before winter. I mean, this part of the project will be done before winter. They'll do it all in one day, so there won't be any disruption to any observing out at YRS. Good to know. Thanks, Jurgen. Thank you for yeah. looking forward. Yes, I, I think it's important to do. And I myself and I know a few others who have been victim of having a go-to telescope running out of one of the outlets and then lost power unexpectedly. <laughs> it's not much fun, but hopefully we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we avoid issues like that in the future that turns it into a gone to telescope yeah <laughs> <Gone. laughs> we're toying with the idea of running a copper bar out to each pad so everybody can have 2000 amps Ooh. <laughs> get a lot of smoke out of those uh, mounts out there boy those mounts will really spin they'll spin fast and but in the last five minutes before the start of our presentation tonight, we have a week from tonight, virtual moon over Monona Terrace happening. And if you go to the official Monona Terrace website, there is a link there where you can get a, an Eventbrite registration to join us that evening. As of now, we're looking at have, uh, having more or less three channels of activity, more or less a lot like what we did last year, where we're going to have one live channel where we're going to feature uh, a couple of live feeds from telescopes. Um, one of the telescopes I'll be running at the on the roof of Monona Terrace and hopefully getting some views of the moon and planets. And then we have a friend of ours down in Chicago uh, named James. Oh, now I'm spacing out. Uh, oh, man. I, I know his name's James. <laughs> He's a, a, a oh, John. Schweitzer. James Schweitzer, and he, yeah, he's going to be uh, giving us some live shots of some other deep sky objects, including, uh, I think he says he, he can give us a shot of Neptune, um, some nebula and uh, uh, galaxies and, uh, and, and uh, even maybe a globular cluster. Well, there's so that there. should, oh, what? Yeah, it weather should be a lot of, <laughs> yeah, weather permitting. So in case, as Wynn rightly pointed out, if the weather doesn't cooperate, then we're going to have a few volunteers joining us at Monona Terrace to do a little show, show and tell of their personal telescope equipment. And Chris is kindly helping us out with that. Thanks, Chris. Oh, Chris is, Chris, oh, you're uh, muted, Chris. And Chris is still muted. There we go. There I go. think we have about a half a dozen. Good, that's perfect. Folks, I'm bringing two. Carol, are you and Kevin coming? Do you know for sure yet? Oh, Great. okay. You're muted, but I think that's a yes. Yeah, thank you so much for everyone who's volunteered for that. And so then if then if we have a weather situation where we have absolutely no live telescopes, then we're going to have uh, Jeff Shockler give us uh, an update on his ever so excellent presentation of the fine features of the moon that he gave us from a bunch of his images last year. And if, if the weather is bad, we won't have to miss out on that. And I'd like to thank Jeff for that. And then on the second live channel, we are going to have a, a a planetarium style sky show presented by Jeff Holt of the Madison Memorial High School of uh, Planetarium. And also John Rummel is going to be joining on us on that. And then we'll have a third channel of pre recorded material and, uh, and presentations um, that will be up 
and available for everyone to look at even a few days before the event, just sort of an appetizer. Does anybody have any questions about Moon Over Monona Terrace? All right. And I don't really have any other announcements. Is there anybody who's not joined us before would like to introduce themselves to the group? Any new members of Madison Astronomical Society here? Anybody who's done some fun and exciting observing sessions recently that they'd like to share with us? Well, we've gotten some nice nights before this weather kicked in out at YRS. The smoke's finally gone away. So I don't know that I found anything exciting, but it was really nice to get out and observe and socialize. Yeah. yeah, this is Jeff. Yeah, out at YRS, I've been uh, working on trying to do some wide field narrowband imaging. So essentially attaching a Canon wide field lens at about 35 millimeters to my CCD camera and doing H alpha of whole constellations with that. And I finally got the rig working. And some of you may have seen on Facebook my first attempt at uh, an integration of all the gas in, in um, Cygnus. Uh, pretty, pretty cool. I'm looking forward to experimenting more with that uh, this fall. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that shot. I think I could spot the veil nebula, though, like the whole. Yeah, the veil was really clear. Yeah. Even uh, Pickering's Triangle, which surprised me, was very obvious, even in that really, really wide field shot. So it's fun to try and do something a little different. I bet you're looking forward to Bernard's Loop this winter? Uh, yes, sir. I'm definitely <laughs> planning on hitting, uh, hitting Orion when uh, it's well positioned. Great, great. Anybody else? I... I tried to get out to YRS on sat two Saturdays ago with my father-in-law and the forecast kept uh, showing partly cloudy um, until a certain time. And then I'd check at that time and then it would show partly cloudy an hour later. And I, I said, this is, this is not looking good. And uh, went and flew, um, flew my simulator. And then I came back out of the basements after a while and looked outside and it was crystal clear. So I said, all right, it's go time. Let's go out to YRS. And uh, he and I loaded up the car, drove out to YRS, got out there, and a thick uh, layer of clouds had uh, covered covered the sky. And call so, that a sucker hole. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So we, uh, <laughs> lesson learned. So we got out there and we, we walked around YRS. And what do you know? But it, it cleared up while we were just you know walking around the site there and I was showing him various things domes and, and structures and so I said well you know nothing ventured nothing gained let's give it a shot and uh, so I set up my uh, rig and wouldn't you know it but another layer of clouds came back over we couldn't even see Jupiter at that point and uh, so we said okay you know this is this is getting worse and then I loaded everything back in the car and then you can guess what the sky looked like when we got back to the belt line. Yep, timing, um, yeah. timing is everything. So, timing is everything. Crystal so clear that, <laughs> up in Madison. So. And speaking of timing, I see that it's 731 and we should probably introduce tonight's speaker. John? So I'm gonna go ahead and mute everybody except um, Dave Lorenz, our speaker, and I. Um, so if you do have a question tonight, Dave is okay with you asking questions. So what we would ask that you do is just, you know, like normally wait for there to be a lull, you know, wait for Dave to take a deep breath or something and unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. And Dave also will uh, just, you know, add some time at the end for sort of a Q&A session too. So I do want to introduce Dave Lorenz. Um, this is this is really a treat for me because about maybe seven or eight years ago, I uh, you know stumbled across on the web a resource called the Dark Sky Finder, and uh, started using it enthusiastically and sharing with a lot of you and and really getting a lot of mileage out of it. And at some point, I went onto the website and read the fine print to just see who some of the developers were. 
And I looked up this Dave guy and he works at UW Madison. You know, this, this is a Madison guy. And so of course my first question was, why is this guy not a member of our club? And so we're gonna subpoena him tonight and get an answer to that question later on. But uh, Dave works at um, the Center for Climate Studies for climatic studies. Uh, he's an atmospheric uh, specialist, uh, got quite a publication record. Uh, but as far as astronomy goes, Dave is one of us. He is an amateur astronomer and he's a big, uh, he's a big fan of dark skies. And so Dave actually had a big hand in putting together this tool that I use. He's got a, a new tool on uh, a website now that I'm also familiar with. Um, and I, I've been like, you know, an amateur using his website tonight. I am really interested in Dave kind of digging into the weeds of how this thing works and how this data is put together. So everybody, please welcome Dave Lorenz and uh, uh, Dark Sky Data. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Uh, so let me get the, everything set up here. So actually, this is my uh, first time talking about this. So I have this, the summary was posted and uh, since then I've, I've made my talk and so things have changed a little. So it's not quite the, the same, but it, it's, you know, it's about the modeling of light pollution. This, just the little details are off. So um, there's two main things I, uh, I'm gonna talk about. So like, what are the light pollution maps exactly? And then the second part is what are they not? And this sort of came up because of just misconceptions I've heard on the internet and things. So uh, what are they? So the sh short answer is they're artificial brightness at zenith. So straight up, it doesn't have to do uh, anything directly with like light domes or anything like that. And then what are they not? Uh, the portal dark sky scale. So, uh, Here's a schematic showing, uh, say we're at, we're at night, and then actually, can you see my mouse? Okay, so we have a source of light, and then let's say miles away, we have this observer who's looking up. And um, so you have this light beam going up, and there wouldn't be any light pollution if there wasn't any scattering. So to get the light pollution, you need to have a scatterer up here. And for a zenith sky brightness, the, the final scattering has to occur straight up above the observer because that's where you're looking. So that's where the, the light's going to come down. So um, this is sort of a qualitative view. So the first quantitative, uh, the per first person to do this quantitatively was this uh, nice set of papers by Roy Garstang in the 1980s, who actually put numbers on the amount of scattering and an extinction that goes on. And so how much light is, is coming back into your eye. So the, the big two papers were, were this one in 1986 and then uh, and in 1989 here. So the Garstang models. Uh, so um, let me see. Okay, so the first thing they have is the obvious. There's the inverse square law where the light intensity decreases by a factor of four for each time you double the distance. And then there's the, uh, you have extinction and scattering and you need to assume by what, and there's two things in his model. There's air molecules and then there's aerosols. So aerosols is just a name for fine particles or droplets in the air, just suspended in the air. So um, the, mod the model simplified the aerosols. They just assume a single typical distribution that varies with height alone. And then the curvature of, Earth, of the Earth is included. And then he considers both single scattering and double scattering. And I'll get to what that means in the next slide. And then things that are ignored, to topographic shielding is ignored. So like if there's a mountain between you and the, the light source, and that, that's gonna block things, but that's not included. And uh, one thing that he did is that is more general than the light pollution atlases is that he um, 
gave the mathematics for the brightness at any point in the sky, not just uh, zenith. So here's an example of double scattering. So we have uh, here's single scattering where it just goes directly to this point above their, your head and double scattering, it bounces out here it, it, and it gets deflected and then scatters back down. And I also gave here uh, examples of the two main scatterers. So aerosols have this kind of distribution that's strongly forward scattering. And then I also showed in gray because it's also, uh, the scattering doesn't really depend uh, much on the wavelength of light. And an example of this would be like, uh, like a hazy day near the sun, the sky gets brighter and whiter. And that's because it's the aerosols, which are strongly forward scattering. So it's, you see it when you're close to the angle of what's making the light. And then here's scattering by my air molecules, which is much more uniform. And actually forward and backward scattering is, is equal in this case. And then the, the amount that's scattered sideways is about a factor of two uh, less than the forward scattering. And for, for zenith brightness, your last scattering scatter is gonna be these molecules because the aerosols do not scatter as much to the side. When you get to like light domes, then that's more caused by like the aerosols. So this is an example of um, one, a light coming out from one direction. So then that to make the total brightness, you need to add up each direction that the light's emanating from this light source. So add that up to get the total contribution and the, and the brightness at Zenith. So the first modern light pollution atlas was this, this nice work by uh, Cinzano, Falchi, and Elvidge. And, uh, and this is in 2001. And they were using satellite data from 1996 to 1997. So before this point, Garstang would just estimate the light just based on the population density. So this was a major advance because now you're actually taking the lights from a satellite. So it's like real, real lights, you know what's going on. And you can see things like, you know, developed versus undeveloped countries have differences in light per capita. You get to see things like mines and other, other sources of light. And then typically the satellite data has a lot of processing involved with this. And actually this, this Chris Elvidge uh, guy right here, he's the one who does the satellite processing. So you have to eliminate things like Aurora, which are very prominent on the raw satellite data and things like bushfires, which they contribute to light pollution, but they're not gonna be there you know, next year necessarily. So you remove those and there's also background noise. And so here's an example of light sources versus the, the light pollution. So um, here, um, this is the Seattle area. So here's the Pacific Ocean here, the Olympic Peninsula, and then the Puget Sound, and then here's Seattle. So the, the raw light sources, you see a lot more of those on the web of like, you know, pictures of these light sources. And they're very fine scale, so you can see for example, like it's in lines because you have the lights clustering by highways and roads and things like that. So the light pollution is like taking this map and then just sort of blurring it. So by you know going way up in the atmosphere, you can have a lot more reach and then you can scatter downwards. So it's, it spreads out your, your sources. And then uh, typically for the, for the light pollution atlases though, you take the logarithm of the raw light pollution so you can better see the dark areas. So for example, just put it on a magnitude scale or something. So here you can see in the, in the center of the Olympic Peninsula, it's, it's hard to really tell if that's really light polluted, but when you do the logarithms, you can see, you know, it's not quite as dark as further out on the coast. So here's a, a history, brief history of the, the light pollution atlases. So the, the first one is in 2001, which I already mentioned. And then you can see a long time passed. Uh, there's September of 2013. And so 
I had, had used this 2000 Atlas a lot, looking around for different places to go. And I was getting kind of impatient with the fact that there was not any updates or anything. So I decided that to try to tackle making my own Atlas. And so in 2013, I'd finally done it. And I used the latest data available at the time, which was 2006. And then I also doubled the number of colors. So instead of just being a green zone, there was a light green and a dark green zone. And the same with the other colors. And then not long after that, the professional uh, astronomers updated the 2001 Atlas. And there were quite a few improvements here. So it was based on a newer satellite, which is actually designed really for this kind of night, faint light detection. It's more sensitive to dim lights. And then they also updated the light extinction and scattering model. So going beyond the Garstang model. And they also assumed the air density uh, was varying with altitude appropriately. And after this, I was thinking, well, I guess I don't really have to update things anymore. This is really great. And people who emailed me, I would refer them to the new Atlas. But then I was looking more closely at it. And it appears that in rural areas, this new Atlas was biased. So here's an example here. So here's my old Atlas 2006 data. And I'm going to call this Atlas the 2015 Atlas, because that's when the satellite data is from. And it, you can see, like, say, in the driftless area here, things are like a whole color zone or maybe one and a half color zones darker in the rural, rural areas. And the cities, though, are about the same. And you can also see more fine scale structure here. And that's just the, the newer satellite that this data is based off of. So really, so what is going on here is to make the atlas, you need to have some assumptions. So the satellite just is measuring the magnitude of the light. And you need to make an assumption of like how the light is uh, going off at different angles. So as a function of zenith angle, how bright is your light source that you're seeing on a satellite? So the original atlas is in purple here. And there's sort of two different components. So there's a component that's centered and it's biggest up, and that's supposed to represent reflection from the ground. And then uh, there's this uh, uh, amount that the light going off to the side increases, increases as you get to low elevation angles. And this is sort of simulating the idea that as you, you have less shielding, for the lights as you get to lower and lower elevation angles. So this is the original form assumed by Garstang and was used in the 2001 Atlas and in my Atlas. And in the new Atlas, they altered the distribution in a, in a huge way where like it's mostly the lights they're assuming are mostly going up and the horizontal beams are actually weaker than up. And I don't really know how this, why they decided this. It was based on a statistical fit, but I think they had too many parameters and there was overfitting going on. It, 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 these are little details. I don't really know exactly why, but anyway, the horizontal beams are what really matter when you get far away from the source. These beams just mostly go out or reflect, you know, scatter right back locally. So it's really the horizontal beams that are important. And so by neglecting them, they made the rural areas too dark. So how do I know it's biased? So, um, so I have a sky quality meter, which is awesome. And I recommend the, the unit that is a narrow band. It's called it's SQM-L. And then there's also some very nice data from the National Park Service, the night sky team. And they've collected like hundreds of, of data points at different nights scattered over the US. And in, in some, they even have a few in Chile, Chile and, and, and Samoa, I think. So lots of data. And so from those, you could, you could sort of see that there's this, it's not a huge bias, but say like 0.3 magnitudes or something. 
So anyway, back to the history. So because of this, I decided to update again. So this was in August, 2020. And I updated based on the latest data, which was 2016 at the time. And this new atlas was, you know, much closer to my 2006 one because I just kept the same assumptions. And then just recently, I updated the 2020 data. And the cool thing about this is that for the first time, they sort of um, consistently processed a bunch of years. So they processed them in the same way. So they're more directly comparable than in years past. So in, in, in previous years, they would just update to a certain year as they were fine tuning all their processing. And so things would change. Plus back in 2006, the data was a totally different satellite. So now for the first time, we might potentially be able to get some good uh, trends out of the data. So basically, if you see a light pollution atlas, there's just two groups that it comes from, like if you see one on the web. So there's the professional group, which you could see uh, the, the three lead authors here are also on this latest paper here, just reordered. So it's basically the same, the same group. And then there's the amateurs, which is me right here. So I did uh, my first foray was a, a small scale effort in 2010. And then I've done these, these uh, atlases here. So um, the 2015 atlas is the one you'll see on lightpollutionmap.info. And then my atlas is in Kevin Palmer's Dark Sky Finder and then Attila Danko's clear sky charts, and then uh, ast astrospheric. And there might be others, but that's what I could find uh, online. Uh, and I looked through my email, and there's some other people that got the data, but I wasn't able to find their uh, tools. So I don't know, I probably missed some, but that's what I was able to find. And then I also, on my website, you can, interact too on open street maps and, and zoom in and, and look around too. Hey Dave, a question. Yeah. Um, you were careful up front to uh, make the observation that that your maps, your color coding, et cetera, do not indicate Bortle, uh, Bortle sky numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a way that you can infer uh, you know, Bortle sky quality based upon the data from your maps, or do you do you discourage that kind of practice altogether? I discourage it, but I will get into detail exactly like how good the correspondence is, how it deviates, and why. So yeah, okay. we'll get yeah, that's a good question though. Good, thanks. Yeah. Short answer is I kind of discourage it. It it, but I'll get into detail. So, um, so now we're going to look at light pollution trends. So before they shouldn't, the different years should not really be compared too closely, but with this new satellite, we hopefully can. And so um, nevertheless, there can be some, some artifacts. So um, one example is LED lights. So the VIR satellite just so happens to be less sensitive to bluish lights than the previous satellite. So it, it will think that lights are dimmer when they aren't. At the same time, newer LEDs tend to be better shielded so that can improve light pollution. So uh, what effect winds? And this isn't the final say, but I just noticed there's a new paper looking at Chelan County, Washington. And they found that there was a countywide retrofit of LEDs and they found that it was brighter with the newer LEDs. Uh, hopefully this isn't a general thing, but anyway, it's an important caveat about trends, unfortunately. And, and are they real or are they not? It's something that you have to think about. And here's another example. So this in the red curve over here is the brightness calculated here I did a, these are on my website but I've done an atlas using this new consistently calibrated data for uh, 2014 through 2020 and here I applied the brightness over the Madison grid point so you can see it's really bright here 
and it gets darker, then there's a slowly increasing trend. So, so what's going on here? Uh, so I, then I looked at the, just got some meteorological data and got the snow depth in Madison averaged over the winter. And the winter is kind of important for the, when the, they're doing the detection because there's much like stray light is much more evident when you're way high in, on the earth, uh, you know, above the earth. And so in winter, when you know the sun's way below the horizon, you get more days to to make a measurement. So this actually matters more than you think. So like here's green is like taking just all days. What's the mean snow depth? And you could see it's high in 2014 and 2020. And then I started to filter. So like the, the satellite, of course, is only seeing when it's clear and when the moon is not present. So I didn't have the cloud cover data, but I thought oh, when the diurnal temperature range is big, then it's probably clear. So I used only, only days when the diurnal temperature range is bigger than seven degrees C and when it's near a new moon, and then you get the blue curve. And you can see now 2014 has the most snow depth during those events and next 2020. And it's not perfect down here, but you could see that it most likely snow cover is a big player here. And so um, it's something else to consider about trends. And in some ways it's real, but I'd say on average, it's probably not, an artificial effect because uh, the snow is affecting the satellite via reflection. But away from light sources, it's the nearly horizontal beams, the ones that are like hugging the horizon that are most important. So it's the fact that it was brighter in 2014 may have mattered right in Madison uh, about the brightness, but say at in a, in, out in the country, it might not have made as much difference the fact that there was mo more snow that year. So there's issues. And so what I've done is I've plotted the trends here, but I did something to help try to filter at least some of the issues. And that is um, I looked for cases where it was monotonically increasing or monotonically decreasing. And if it wasn't, I just, uh, eliminated the trends, didn't plot them. And so hopefully it can filter out some of the things like our area doesn't have red here because uh, I took that snow trend wasn't monotonic. So um, the big thing that stands out globally is the, um, in Asia, like Turkey, China, India, Java, huge uh, increases in light pollution. Other countries which are uh, having civil unrest like Venezuela are decreasing, that's most likely real. But uh, here, this might be an LED uh, change here. And it, it follows political borders. So I guess France may have, have changed over the LEDs. And whether this is real, I'm not sure. There's one study that says it wasn't in one case, but it's, it's harder to say these decreasing trends in the US might be similar. And now I'm gonna just switch over to the web so we can look at the US trends in more detail. So if I zoom down here, you can see Florida has lots of increasing trends, especially the Orlando area. And then for example, Texas, and there's a sort of a pattern here to them. So like the, the city core of Houston hasn't changed much, but it's around the suburbs, you get increases in light pollution. Same with Dallas, Fort Worth. And then there's this oil producing region. Maybe the core hasn't changed as much, but there's been an increase in light in that general area. And then areas in the West, right around Salt Lake City, the Central Valley. For LA, it's the, the Eastern suburbs have increased. So this is the the sort of thing, and this you can this is just on the web, so you can you can look at that on my website. And um, so now I'm going to talk more about like the actual units of of the light pollution atlas and what they are. And first, I'm going to talk about natural background sky brightness. So on a moonless night away from the Milky Way. It's, it's about 22 magnitudes per square arc se second of brightness 
on the sky. And this is not at a star point, it's just this background. And that's equivalent to about one six magnitude star per the area of the full moon. So the sources of this uh, light are air glow, which is sort of like aurora as far as the process uh, involving the molecules and changing energy states. But other than that, it's, it's not related. It's, it's photo ionized uh, atoms returning to their, uh, back to their rest state. And here's an example from the International Space Station. And then the, the next source is zodiacal light. So this is the, the zodiacal light near the ecliptic, so it's nice and bright. But this does not uh, decay away to zero. There's, there's even zodiacal light around the whole sky. And so that's contributing. And then scattered starlight. And these first two are, are the main contributors. And I think air glow might on average be bigger than the zodiacal light. But this is just light that's just there. The lights just the, the scar the sky as you know even at the darkest place is is fairly bright. So now when you look at the here's my light pollution atlas, and so now these color bands have a specific uh, value. These are mathematically calculated, and so there's a, a value. Obviously, it could be biased and all that, but the the model is putting out an actual value. So the darkest you can get is is this under this model assuming background is 22 is 22 magnitudes per uh, a square arc second and then up to like the 21s you get you know these pretty good dark skies and as you get brighter than 21 magnitudes it starts to be uh, harder to see things and then i also have a different kind of unit which is the ratio between the artificial and the natural sky brightness. So for example, one means that uh, the artificial and the natural brightness are the same. So the ratio is one, and that's the boundary right between the, the yellow and the green zone here. So now I'm gonna talk about the, the Bordo scale and um, so it's a, a sort of an empirical way of looking with your eye at different features and objects and assessing the, 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 the quality of the sky. So one is the darkest and nine is the brightest. So zenith brightness, which is the light pollution atlas is a component, obviously it helps you see certain things, uh, but it also assesses the sky quality based on like light domes. So things that are closer to the horizon. And the Bordeaux scale and the first light pollution atlas actually came about at kind of the, the, the same time, which is around 2001. And naturally, people started comparing them, which is fine. But then it's some places it sort of morphed into this equality where the websites will treat them, the colors, as a Bordeaux scale. And it just, and some places people even state their Bordeaux scale not based on any thing they've done with their eyes, but like the value on a map. So, uh, so this is what I'm gonna be using for my Bortle, you know, to test the Bortle scale, I'm gonna put numbers on these different color categories. So one through three are, when you look at different sites comparing this, they're all pretty uh, consistently uh, designated as black, gray, and blue. Here, there's some changes between which colors, uh, scheme you look at, but I'm going to use this one, which actually is sort of the best fit to the data I have, which is this back to this National Park Service night sky team data. So there's like 397 different uh, nights of observations over several hundred different sites. And basically they have a calibrated CCD camera and take 45 frames over 20 minutes and that covers the entire sky. And in addition to this quantitative uh, light data, they also uh, assess the Bortle scale and the naked eye limiting magnitude and other things like that. So here's an example of what's coming out of the camera stitched together into an all sky image. This is from uh, Mauna Kea. So purple is about at like uh, 22 
magnitudes per square arc second. So about as you know dark as it gets. And then um, it brightens up to, and it, it's not perfect, but this these colors roughly correspond to like what the blue, green, and yellow, and blue, and red zone would be on say my map as far as magnitudes per square arc second. So one thing to note is how bright the Milky Way gets in Sagittarius. So this is like over two magnitudes brighter than the background here. And, and these other ones are, are at least a magnitude bigger. You can't see so well here, but that is, I looked at it closely. We can look at that closely uh, if you want. I have all the images and stuff. So, but for now, we'll move on just to some case studies here. So here's, Assateague Island National Seashore on my map. So here's Baltimore, and Washington, and way over by the coast. Here's the site here. So it's in the blue zone in my map. And the specific numbers are 21.76, which is close to the actual measured value, so 21.81. And according to the, the color correspondence keys, this is uh, Bortle 3 because it's in the, in the blue zone. So the, the night sky team assessed the site and they decided it was Bortle 6. So that, that may be slightly too pessimistic, but it, it's at least a four or five because here's these light domes here, which are uh, huge. They go up to like say 45 degrees. So, it, and I think they might've commented that it, uh, interfered with their their dark adaptation and so that's why you get this you know this kind of poor assessment even though in other areas of the sky like up and in the rising milky way over the ocean you can see quite a bit of structure in there but uh it basically the Bortle scale is just a broader metric than zenith and so it's 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 not quite the same thing and here's another exact one more example here in yosemite so here the, 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 the Milky Way was, it was right overhead. So I'm gonna use the darkest point in the sky for the, for the National Park Service measurements. And it's somewhere way up there, but it's not quite at zenith because uh, the Milky Way is overhead. So it's 21.96, which is extremely dark, almost the, the theoretical typical 22. And my light pollution maps, you know, agrees enough that it's in the same color zone. And it's, it's gray on the map, which is supposed to be Bortle 2. But uh, due to significant light domes, they classify this as Bortle 4. And like, for example, this red here, that's, that's, as, that's as bright as like the red zone on a light pollution map for like the zenith brightness. So it's, it's, it's really bright. The, up here, it's really great, but uh, the Bortle scale for Bortle 1 and 2 make no mention of light domes, so it seems, doesn't seem right to classify this as one of those uh, because it, the light domes are significant. So it, as, again, it's the Bortle scale counts the horizon too, and the light pollution map is just straight up. That's all, it, that's all it's about. And now I'm going to just look over all the sites to sort of get a uh, sort of answer John's question, like how good is the correspondence when you when you look at all these sites. So what I've done here is I've 397 nights. So I just picked the ones when it, where it was classified as Bortle 4. And then for all those nights, I plotted the distribution of the actual zenith brightness. So like what the sky map is would look at, except this is the observation, not the, the light pollution map. And so you could see uh, the green kind of magnitude per square arc second is the most likely value when it is Bortle 4. So that's kind of in line with the, the maps, but you could see that it's skewed and there's a bunch of uh, points way out here where you have very dark, uh, a dark sky straight up but it's not, it's classified as Bortle 4. So this is, what this means is that there's a dark overhead, but it's bad because of light domes. This is essentially what this is saying. And here I, I've done that for um, uh, Bortle 5s and 6. 
And so again, it's sort of tracking, but there's this, there's some, there's a tail that's like way out here where you have these sites that are sort of not appropriate based on their zenith brightness. You'd think they were better, but then, but the Bortle number is worse than you would expect based on the zenith. And now I'm gonna look at the same thing, but for Bortle one, two, and three, and here the story is kind of different. So uh, there is some sort of sense of, uh, of you getting, uh, when you're in Bortle three, you have more green levels of brightness compared to say Bortle one or two, but it's really, it's more like there's this band of uh, light brightness. So if you're in Bortle one or two, you're kind of, uh, your sky brightness is somewhere kind of low, but it doesn't have to be black or anything like that. And so uh, what this could mean is that like you could have a really awesome site and the extinction could be like really low. So in that case, you're getting a lot of light from the sky and the, the stars and everything and that's contributing. And the other thing is there's actually, when you look at the light pollution map uh, colors, so I'll go back here. The differences between these zones is actually not that much when you get right down here. So this is up to 1% of natural. Here's one to 6% of natural, and only up to like 20% here. So like by eye, just looking at Zenith, I, I don't think you could really detect a difference. It might still be important for distinguishing a site, but it's sort of indirect. It's sort of like this might be a proxy for light domes, even though it's not calculating that. But as far as like what this is actually supposed to mean, as far as zenith brightness, you probably can't tell the difference between black and blue zone. So that's sort of what this is saying. That uh, portal one, two, and three, you, you you can't really say much about like what zenith brightness. They're all just very dark. It's the light domes which travel further. They have a more reach that that would maybe distinguish. And I can give it. Here's a, a nice example here of a bright Bortle one. So this is Great Basin National Park in Nevada, and the light pollution map is basically almost as dark as I can get. It's in the black zone. And it's supposed to be border one, and it was classified as border one, but the brightest point in the sky, I mean, the darkest point in the sky was 21.6, which puts it uh, supposedly in, in the, the green zone. So here's a, the, a map of the, of the sky at that point. So the sky is bright, but it's very transparent. So that helps you be able to see things and there's, and you can also see there's this band of like glow around here. See how it's brighter down by the horizon compared up to here. That's the air glow, which was bright enough that you could see its color. Gegenschein was easily seen. M33 was easy with direct vision. So these are all hallmarks of Bortle 1, maybe Bortle 2. But it, so it's, it's, it's definitely an excellent site. But basically, the, the zenith brightness is just not the whole story is what this is saying. Dave, let me, yeah. let me jump in there. I, I've observed a Great Basin a number of times. Great Basin is so remote. It is yeah. so dark. How on earth does the zenith brightness come up to 2160 at Great Basin? How, how does that happen? Well, there's, you know, there's other sources of light. So it looks like it was, if I had to guess, it's, in this case, it was probably mostly air glow. And then secondarily, the extinction was very low. So like actually climbing a mount, I, like looking on astronomy forums, I sort of noticed that people out west, they tend to get higher uh, readings with their SQM. And I think that's just because it's, it's not, it's actually better conditions, but it's more transparent. And I was actually in Nevada this summer in a very remote place. And my, uh, I would, my measurements were 21.7 something but the sky was far darker than anything I'd seen in Wisconsin, even though I've gotten that same reading in Wisconsin. So yeah, well, yeah it's just, thanks. yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's, 
it's, it's a very important tool, this uh, measure of zenith brightness, especially when you get to brighter sites, but it, it's not absolutely everything, especially when you get to darker sites and other things uh, can matter. And it, especially like if you look at the, like I said before, the difference between blue and black, as far as like the amount of light is almost nothing, like 10% of natural brightness difference. That's just not something that's gonna affect things. So, um, oh, actually, yeah, so then that's it. And now I'm, I'm ready for questions. So I, I guess I'll, I'll start with a comment that, um, a, a huge part of the amateur astronomy community is very, very infatuated with the Bortle scale. Uh, Bortle is almost kind of a demigod and people uh, forget that Bortle scale is completely observational. There, there's really no underpinning of, of uh, it's not data-based as much as it is. It's like how many stars can you see in a particular region, limiting magnitude. Uh, and, you know, of course, the, the, I guess, the zenith brightness, but a lot of people assume, I think, because they have conflated models like what you've done with the Bortle scale over the years, people do think that your colors directly correspond one-to-one -one with Bortle numbers. And so I appreciate you dispelling that, but, uh, but people are almost incapable of talking about the quality of dark darker, darkest skies without resorting to Bortle numbers, most of the time not really knowing why a number one is a number one or a number two is a number two. So um, I, I, I like the fact that you and others are trying to visually model this a lot more, <clears throat> but I'm still confounded by how Great Basin could have that bright of a zenith uh, measurement. That, that just seems so yeah. weird to me. Yeah, that was that was the most extreme Bortle one. I, I, so that's why I picked it up. But yes, there there but there's some Bortle twos that again have like this extreme, extreme brightness. And so it, what it's saying, I guess, is the Bortle's harder to. It's harder work. You got to really uh, look around and see what you see. But in the end, I'd I'd say I'd rather be in a Bortle one than in a place with an SQM of 22 because it's really capturing what you're most interested in its actual observations. At the same time, my tool means you can look anywhere in the world and at least have a good idea of what's there. But yeah. it, you know, that's my opinion about what the utility of, of each. Yeah, and those, this is Lawrence. Those interesting results with that Bortle one site. I, I was kind of wondering, you know, maybe is the detector, the, you know, the sensor you're using, what if it was more sensitive to infrared, whereas the human eye isn't as sensitive to that red sky glow? Do you have any thoughts on maybe that causing a little bit of bias? Um, I don't know the details, but I, I know they have filters on it to be like human vision. It, it, uh, but I, I don't believe that. I think this is real. This, this is just the way it is. I think they even, I don't know, I, I, I didn't do the whole thing. They might have even said the sky seems brighter, but I think it's real. The air glow is big enough. You don't usually see this. Uh, it's so bright that you're seeing it around near the horizon. So maybe if they had made assessments here, they might have not thought it was more to one, but like, I think M33 is way up here somewhere. So like they were, you know, they were able to see that that very well. And then you can see some of the previous maps like Yosemite is obviously darker. Uh, and I'm sure you probably, I don't know what, you might've been able to see M33 very well, but the, it's just this Bortle has this other factors that are involved like the, the light domes. And actually I have, I have a map with all these, we can look at a bunch of these because I have a, a, a web browser up with the links to all these sites so we can see like different things if you'd like to get an idea. But I think this is real. It's bright, but good. It's not That's super true. bright. Again, it's just 0.4 magnitudes brighter. So it's, you know. 
Yeah, John, sorry to burst your bubble. Uh, Great Basin is so dark, it's bright. So, you know, that's that's how it goes. It's too many stars. You got too many stars there, man. <laughs> and actually, this is up on a mountain here. It's like 11,000 feet. So it's like an incredible sight, I'm sure. It was also very windy, they said. It was like hard to, it wasn't good as far as the wind. And some of us don't care what you see below 10 degrees altitude. You know, that's all kind of in the wash anyways, but 10 degrees on up, then yeah, that yeah. looks pretty good to me. I have a, yeah. I have a question about uh, durability here, then or stability. The This is Jürgen. When when you're, you're measuring zenith mm -hmm. and the the um, the borderless, put it that way, or the 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 sky glow that you see, or the, or the glow that you see off the zenith. How stable is that over days? If you measure it at a given time of day, how stable is that over time? Oh, it will vary, and I think this one. I will... mean, on a day to on a day to day basis, or yeah. Okay. So there was another measurement they took the next year. And it was quite, it was actually darker. It was like 21.9 something. Okay. There were and different observers and they actually gave it a higher Bortle number. And I can actually, I, mean, I could even, I could draw that up. So like there you could see it's sort of, uh, so it's sort of this light blue color. But if I go here, are all the sites. And so if I go here, let's see which one. So this is that same site, but a different day. I think it's a year later. So you can see now there's purples, where it is in, in mine, this, this example here, it was dark blue. So that's like the difference between 21.6 something and, and about 22. How about variation? Yeah, air, air glow is very var variable. If I, if, I were, if I were gonna go out in, in some place and say observe from 10 at night to two in the morning, how much variability would there be in the zenith? I mean, if I were actually interested in something just at the zenith, it mm -hmm. seems that your measurements actually trump the Bortle scale. Yeah, adds, if you're just looking at zenith, it, it's much more relevant, although there's still transparency. You, there's an example here in this data set where the Apostle Islands they had a, a thing and it was a very good site and it, but it was off the day they took the, the zenith brightness was very dark, like darker than 22, but it was because the extinction was up near like 0 0.49. They took that measurement too. And so it was dark, but it was, it was because of the transparency, it was a good site, but it, it's probably like a blue zone site or something, but it would seem better than it was so zenith is so what i'm saying is the maps are mo very relevant for zenith but again even there they're not everything because transparency can affect things how well you can see so if you're at a place that's away from everything it can be dark just because it's kind of murky and it doesn't necessarily mean everything so it's, it, the, the brightness is not everything Jürgen, if you're interested in the variability of air glow, I seem to recall, and this was quite some years ago, so I may not be recalling too well, but uh, I remember going out to Pine Bluff Observatory uh, uh, when the space place was, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing some stuff out there, and they had some tours of the facilities, and they had a very large etalon there, which they were using to make quantitative measurements of air glow. Uh, and I, I can't recall anything about who the researcher was or what they were doing. I know they were going to take some readings in the northern hemisphere and, and some in the southern hemisphere, but possibly in that kind of data, it might give some indication of what the uh, you know, time scale variability of air glow is. I, I think there's some cases where it can vary minute to minute where you'll see it undulate and stuff almost like a faint wispy cloud. But I haven't experienced that, but it's definitely can be very variable. It's the most variable one of those, you know, natural sky brightness things. Yeah, I've seen time exposure photographs on a scale of 30 minutes where you can see air glow 
rippling across the sky like ripples on the surface of a pond. Uh, air glow can vary quickly. Dave, I wanted to get back and ask you something that you and I talked about briefly the other day. Um, the, the area is like Western North Dakota near Williston with oil and natural gas extraction and what's happening down in West Texas near Odessa and Midland now. How much, um, like what just what's going on in those areas that they are producing such incredibly bright blooms on zenith brightness? Yeah, so I, you, could, you could zoom in, I think, and you'll be able to see in the satellite. So here's a white zone in the middle of nowhere in North Dakota. And if we like go to the, the world imagery and turn this off, you see all this uh, like equipment and stuff. Like, look at this. So it's all the, the fracking and uh, the fracking boom in North Dakota. And then oil and gas is always a really big thing and in, in down in near Odessa, Texas. So there's- Remember they're flaring yeah. off natural gas from a bunch of those wells. And so yeah. that's gonna contribute to it. Yeah, that, and that that would be something I'm not, my, my maps aren't best made for because how those emit is different than a light fixture. So it may not, you know, maybe something maybe sort of off and how it is because it's not your typical <laughs> light source, but it's definitely bright. And I actually have the 2006 Atlas here. You can click, you can see there, there was nothing pretty much. 2016, it was already big. And then it's even grown since 2016. I think the one down here might've been more steady, but I don't remember. I think but, the one in Texas is much more dramatic oh, in 2020. Oh yeah, it, no, it, it wasn't so bad in 2006. So this is recent too, and then it's, even blown up since then. so they're both they're all trending up and some of these places like in we mentioned nevada there's some places that are like mines there's nothing here as far as people living if this is this is a mine for some reason i remember this one here's a gold mine it's in the middle of nowhere in, in the Great Smoky Valley. It's like remote is remote. You could go out here planning some observing and then by accident end up right close to this mine and it, things are not gonna be as, as good as you hoped. <laughs> and my experience with some of those mines and areas where I've been in Arizona and New Mexico is that they have, you know, like arc lights that they use for nighttime work and those arc lights might be on until midnight when a shift is over. And after the shift is over, they, they might turn off the lights. And so you might have a blazing light dome on your Western horizon. And at midnight, boom, it just goes away um, when the mining operation ceases for the night and they go home. So it just, it depends on how far away those things are and what's going on. There's all sorts of confounding things going on with this. Yeah, so this just this important nugget of information, maybe I should even post this on my website, that the overpass time is 1.30 or something a.m. So most people have, that turn off their lights have done so. Interesting. And then another, another comment based on a question, uh, just around here, I noticed that it gets darker, uh, say from 10 to like one or two. And I think it might be headlights, but with like my sky quality meter, you'll take a measurement. And it, I think almost all cases, it's brighter when I first take one. And then when I'm leaving and I take one, it's, it's the darkest. So, and it could be, I don't know. I, I shouldn't know a number off the top of my head, I, but it's at least uh, 0.1 or 0.2 magnitudes darker. In the middle a little of the after night. bar closing time and, and yeah. <laughs> enough time to get home. Hey, Dave. Yeah. As a Milky Way photographer, to me, the horizon is important. So am I better off looking at the Bortle scale for that versus your maps? Because it's less important to me at Zenith and more important for me to see details in the Milky Way core, which are gonna be closer to their horizon. 
yeah, so Bortle scale is more important. The problem is, is that Bortle, uh, there are no maps for that. There, there are maps that say they are, but they aren't. So like the, the example I know is, is lightpollution.info. .info. And if you, you click on this, you'll get like even a, a, a Bortle reading to go with that, but that's not, it's not like it has more information. It's just claiming to have more information. So like I click a point near Madison. So this, this is an actual thing that this is calculating, but then it gives you a Bortle class. And that's just, that's what I'm saying is you can't, there's no perfect correspondence between those. At the same time, probably the, uh, a, one thing to note is that I said, you can't really tell at Zenith the difference between blue and black, but this difference is kind of a proxy for light domes. So like, in, the only way to get black is to be far enough away. And so you're probably not really have any significant light domes either. So like, it's not what I'm directly calculating, but sort of indirectly, it's giving you that information. So yeah, so in summary, there's, there are maps that claim to be Bortle, but they're not, they're just the same thing as I have. But one thing I'm thinking of doing is, if I have the time, is actually doing more than just Zenith. So making a map that's say like a point 30 degrees above the Southern horizon or something and see what that looks at. Like, let's see, uh, if, is it, can you just guess what it is from this map or is that something entirely different and, and useful? So I don't know when that will be, but hopefully in the next year or something, uh, calculate that and see what, what that's like. I'm always trying to figure out how far away from these light domes I need to be for optimal Milky Way photos mm -hmm. to the south. Yeah. It, so I've, I've gone to some sites here in the blue, and not all of them have the best horizons, but even here you could... They're small light domes, but they're definitely, it's definitely better there than like say, uh, even here in the dark green here, Dodgeville is a light dome. It stands out. Yeah, my, my uh, two cents, Carol, for your question is the more remote you are, and you can tell with a map like Dave's, you know, you can sort of roughly calculate or exactly calculate you know, how far you way, away you are from major population centers. And the Bortle crowd would say that if you have a major population center, like, you know, a couple hundred thousand people or larger within a hundred mile radius or something like that, then you're going to have unacceptable light domes on long, long exposure photography, uh, like Milky Way, that's got a horizon in the field of view. Um, and that's, that's probably true, 100 miles, 150 miles, some people will say 200 miles. Uh, you know, again, it's all non-scientific, it's all very subjective. But you go back to that spot in Nebraska where you were a minute ago yep. today. Um, yep. that's, that's a good true. example, because I was just there a couple of weeks ago. You look at North Platte is well over 100 mm -hmm. miles as the crow North flies North. from that dark zone in, in North Central Nebraska. I promise you, you would not be able to get North Platte's light dome on a long exposure photo, um, unless you were really pushing things like way too far. I don't think you can see North Platte at all from that area. So if you get above about a hundred miles and that area in Nebraska is a good example of this, you're gonna have really dark skies. Most people would say that's gonna be borough warm. Yeah. Question, um, how far north and south do you go and how much of the world Appear, I'm going to go out and look at your maps, but I'm just curious how yeah. far north and south and you cover yeah. everything in the mid latitudes around the world. It's like 75 or something, which is what the satellite is similar to what the satellite data is. Mm -hmm. And I think it might be 60 something in the south. I I'm just curious what central Australia looks like. Yeah, so very good. The, the southern hemisphere people are the best skies and the darkest skies. It's like not fair so here, there was a, like amazing a neighbor went to, i think it was two years ago was actually in australia just about where your mouse had been um okay. doing some, um observing 
So I was wondering what it would be like there. But yeah, they it, have a lot of smoke right now. Yeah, so it's not... Well, he was there before the fires. Right. But yeah, it's just amazing. That Australia is just awesome. Like there's, it's so even near Sydney, you could probably drive an hour and you're like in gray or something. I mean, it's just, it's really easy to get to places dark. They have a, they have a lot of astronomy clubs in Southern Australia. But of course they also have uh, more poisonous species there yeah. than anywhere else on Earth. All the, all the most poisonous snakes are yeah. around, yeah. Spiders, snakes, huh? et cetera. <laughs> Hey Dave, uh, Dave yeah. Leifert here. Uh, so I've been taking a real interest in light pollution and the, the maps and what's been done out there. And I, I did notice that the domes and stuff not at the zenith can really have a negative impact that may not be uh, re really show up well in those readings. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been very interested in incorporating light below the zenith into this and maybe even taking a crack, you know, in the future at try to incorporate that or, you know, show what it would be for mm -hmm. people who are interested. Um, so I did see a lot of work out there and I saw your work and noticed you were local. So I'm wondering, is there any opportunity for other people to help contribute to your work? Um, there's, I mean, it's most, it's like coding, maybe coding the Garstang model to be more general, but I, I mean, it's it's probably like, easier for me because I've already done it, so I could. I mean, but, yeah. It, the main thing would be like, yeah. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure exactly, you, but you could always write up a method with the list of equipment needed and how to make the observ observations and how to record them, and people just follow the I, plan. Yeah, actually, observations are probably that's the thing where I can't really contribute at all. So like. The National Park Service method is actually all documented in like a paper, like how they they made all those measurements and and that data is very high quality. It's really, really good. Unfortunately, it seems they stopped in 2016 or something, but. Yeah, that's one of the things I noticed and I, that was frustrating me as well that that these maps, a lot of this was not coming out regularly. Yeah, and I, I think going forward, based on the website with the satellite data, I think there should be yearly updates now. Okay. Yeah, but uh, the problem is there are issues with the satellite. So getting good ground truth data would be indispensable because, again, the satellite's not sensitive to blue light compared to sodium lights and things like that. It's so sure. Yeah. Um, by the way, I'm an IT professional, so it's it's kind of in my background to oh. help crunch the numbers and come up with ideas and ways to do stuff like that. Well, sure, yeah. I mean, you could contact me and you could see like what we could do or something. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm I'm really interested in this uh, area. If you need ground yeah, truthing, great. John's 4,000 mile drives every so often would be perfect for ground truthing. So just attach a detector to him and, and you've got all you need, all the data you need. I don't know. I get the sense that Dave might, uh, Dave might put on more miles on his car than I put on mine. Yeah, I took one trip out west. Yeah, I don't, I'm don't not sure how many. So yeah, this year. So it was just six days, but I, yeah, I put a lot of miles on my car. <laughs> Dave, I have a question about LEDs. What do you think the trend's gonna be overall in light pollution with a switch over to LEDs? Yeah, so it's like... But they are doing more shielding along with the switch over too. Yes, so... Up until like a week ago, I thought, well, it could be darker, it could be brighter. Like these places, according to the size, darker. And then I just read that new study. So this was in Chelan County over here. And let's see, over over the over the years, like this is like uh, seven years of data. It has even the satellites detected it getting brighter. 
So maybe I'm because I'm doing a longer time period and I, I can uh, detect the actual change. So they they found it was getting brighter here due to the retrofit, but that Veer's satellite was saying it was darker. My just sort of vague impression, just looking at the lights that are new near my area is that they've got to be better for light pollution just because they're so well shielded. Uh, it, just the problem is the satellite. I don't know whether they had much control over what sensitivity the satellite is or whether they someone just didn't think or what, but it's unfortunate that the satellite is not as sensitive to the blue lights. To, to like really know. So that's another example where the measurements, some sort of measurements. I know I've been having, I've had my SQM for like a decade and I haven't really noticed any, there's bigger changes from night to night just on the meteorology. And overall, I don't think, I think it's been stable as far as light pollution. Thanks. Yeah. Dave, a question on the SQ, SQMs. Yeah. I'm seeing they also make a different type that are permanently mounted that we just measure continuously. I'm sure you're familiar with those. And then it downloads the data. And I, I'm wondering if you have any experience with, with those. Is that more useful information? It'd probably be more useful because you go all the time and you, you probably have this envelope. You probably have a, you know, a noisy time series, but you take sort of the envelope of the darkest events, which is usually when there's no clouds and, and ha have that data, that would be, I think that would be, these things aren't perfect, but with a continuous monitoring, that would be even, even better, really, if, if you had a long time series of that, you could see sort of where it maxes out and gets darkest. And that's probably the, the relevant data. And you could then make a time series of that and, and, and see. There's some issues where like when it, it, you can tell the Milky Way is brighter, for example, like this time of year, if you want the darkest reading, you need to point it a little off to the Milky Way, like an Aries or something, because the Milky Way is, you know, several uh, tenths of a magnitude brighter. So in, in, in a city, it doesn't matter. You can point it anywhere. So, yes, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, statistically speaking, if you're looking for extremes, you want the maximum amount of data you can get. Because the mean, you know, you can get that with relatively a small sample. But if you, if you want to get more accurate information about the ends of the distribution, you really need to get a lot of points. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I'm, yeah, my opinion is those would be vastly better if you have a place where it's set up and somehow protected from rain or something and, and a continuous measurement is, is vastly better. Thanks. I've been kicking that around. I've been taking readings at, uh, Kickapoo Valley Reserve up in Vernon County to apply for dark sky designation. And I've been running into the same thing you're describing of just going up at various times of the year. And the readings just seem to vary so much. And I'm left wondering, well, is it the Milky Way? Yeah. Is it increased humidity in the air? Is it because I was alone one time with John Rummel the other time? Of what's leading to these to these yeah, variations usually the, usually the first measurement as you probably know but people who don't have one is is not so good you like want to take take several and like the first two or three you don't regard and then you like average the next 10 and sometimes this is narrow band but the axis actually isn't pointed straight out it's like a 10 degree tilt or something i noticed by like sampling oh. the milky way that it's actually it's a little and i think it but because it's off, it's probably different between units, but I think mine's like pointed a little bit toward the display. So it's like pointed off and I forget whether it's left or right, but it, it's, you know, it's like 10, 20, you know, degrees or something. So it's something, they're amazing because, you know, usually this would be thousands of dollars to make any sort of faint, you know, photometry, but they're not, there, there's, there's issues with them to, yeah, to be careful. IDA had the recommendation, I'm sure you saw, which is to uh, rotate around as you're taking oh, the readings okay. to yeah, kind yeah, of, yeah. and I guess that's to level out those. <laughs> yeah. Level those out. I haven't been seeing that's making a big difference, but again, yeah, getting variation. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Sure. 
I, I live in the country. And one of the things that I've noticed, I'm south of Stoughton and between Stoughton and Oregon, mm -hmm. and the towns have been growing and the light domes are getting bigger. And while they may be shielding for, for a lot of this, the thing you run into in the country is people move out to the country and they put these big honking lights on their house and they are not shielded and yep. they, are, <laughs> they are ugly. Yeah, I know. It and I, yeah, most of my, actually, I probably, I said there was stable, I think maybe my house, which is around here, it's been increasing, but mo I do most of my observing out somewhere further away, but so yeah, when you have the growth of those houses, that, that's got to be increasing it, and it's, yeah, the, the shielding's worse than even old sodium lights, and yeah, and farm yeah. lights are like that too, and Fortunately, not every farmer's like that. It, it's it, it, you go out and you really you look closely and you realize that actually there are a bunch of houses with no no spotlights on. You just don't see them. But th there's some sites that could be potentially better that have like a, a glare. And actually, and I didn't show any of these because it's sort of a That's different true. thing. But so, the national park data, some of them they gave a bad bordel just because of the glare of like some you know. Uh, like railroad yard or something had this glare going on. But Ironically, the, uh, the the farm lights were sold as a security measure, but uh, certain people have found that uh, they actually, uh, you know, point out here's something where you can go and take stuff from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and so actually, <laughs> you're you're basically advertising yourself to uh, potential vandals and thieves. Yeah, and a lot of times there's nobody at those places watching. Oh yeah, they're on all night. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, it's it's hard. Yeah, I I figure we we've lost a lot of darkness in the last five years at my house. Mm. Hey, I'm, I'm just noticing, uh, I'm taking a look at the wa line Waterloo south to Fort Atkinson and the way the highways define changes in brightness yep. along the western edge. Yep, you could see that. And then like even like Military Ridge has some like, like Highway 151, it's sort of brighter elements along it. So like some potential things like Blue Mound are kind of too close to the highway to be as good as you would hope and things like that. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Do we have any last questions for Dave tonight? Going once, going twice. And I just have to thank you, you know, thank you for so, putting so much of your time, effort and expertise into uh, something that a lot of us, we, I mean, we just turn on an app and see a light pollution map and we take for granted all the hard work and, and it takes, you know, dedication, people who are really uh, enthusiastic about this hobby of ours and astronomy in general. So on, on behalf of Madison Astronomical Society, thank you for all your hard work and thank you for this great presentation tonight. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And feel free to give us an up Madison Astronomical Society an update on your work if you ever have updates or things. Okay, sure. And um, before we sign off tonight, I'd like to remind everybody that we are meeting again on November 12th, Friday, November 12th. John, are you still here? Or maybe John logged off. <laughs> so in that case, we won't get a sneak peek for next month's presentation. But anyways, I look forward to seeing you all next month and uh, clear skies and stay safe, everyone. Thanks.